Chapter 9 is on muscle physiology. Okay, first we're going to review through the types of muscle. Skeletal muscle is your voluntary muscle. It is attached to bones or skin. It's striated, very powerful, and most of what we're going to talk about is going to be skeletal muscle in this chapter. Cardiac muscle has its own chapter later on uh, next semester only in the heart, striated, involuntary, and has intercalated discs that are their distinguishing characteristic. Smooth muscles, hollow organs, except of course the heart, stomach, urinary bladder, airways, not striated and involuntary. So as you look at your skeletal muscle, you can clearly see the striations or stripes, the multiple nuclei here, and each muscle fiber or cell, we call the cells fibers, is the length of the entire muscle. With your cardiac muscle, you have the short fat cells and they are connected by these intercalated discs. In smooth muscle, you don't have this distinct striation. You still have your actin and myosin. You just have individual little cells and they have the same fine tuning control you have with the other types of muscle. Okay, all muscle has specific characteristics. They're excitable. Another word for that is they're responsive or irritable. In other words, they receive a stimuli and they respond to that stimuli. They're contractile. They can shorten when stimulated. They're extensible. They can be stretched. They have elasticity. Once they stretch, they can recoil back to their original length. Muscle function, movement of bones or fluids, maintaining posture, stabilizing joints, heat generation. Okay, each muscle is going to be served by one artery, one vein, and one nerve, at least. Muscle, this is again skeletal muscle has connective tissue sheaths that give it a strength at, and also a connecting point. The epimesium is around the entire muscle. Paramecium is around fascicles or groups of muscle fibers. And as you remember, we don't say muscle cell, we say muscle fibers because you think of cells as being little bitty things, but whereas a muscle cell is the length is tremendous where it's microscopically thin. And then the endomesium surrounds each specific fiber. Here we have a bone here and a, a muscle. And you have your epimesium around the entire muscle. And then it's magnified greatly to show you a fascicle. And the fascicles are wrapped by paramecium. And then each individual muscle fiber is wrapped by an endomesium and then within that we will see that we have our sarcolemma and then within that we're going to have our myofibrils. Now these continue all this connective tissue here at this level, at this level, at this level joins together. They go the length of the entire muscle and they join together to form the tendon to make that muscle strong. Muscles can attach directly, as in the epimesium of the muscle is fused to the periosteum of the bone or perichondrium of the bone, of the cartilage, I'm sorry, or indirectly uh, by rope like tendons, or in the case of, for example, your abdominal muscles, a sheet like structure called an apoptosis. And this is showing the different layers. From the outside, epimesium, little fascicle here, wrapped by the paramecium, the muscle fiber, uh, surrounded by the endomesium. And then as they pull out the layers of that, you have your sarcolemma around that, which is a cell membrane. And then bundles and bundles of these long myofibrils. Uh, typical skeletal muscle can be anywhere from 
10 microns, maybe 100 microns in diameter, 30 centimeters long. So very long, but microscopically thin. Many nuclei, because if you don't have many nuclei, the cell doesn't know what to do. The, the message will never get to the end heart. Many, many mitochondria, so they can uh, burn oxygen for energy. Glycosomes store glycogen, which is the, the human animal equivalent of starch. Myoglobin stores oxygen, such as hemoglobin stores oxygen in the bloodstream. They also have your myofibrils, sarcoplasmic reticulum, and T-tubules. Myofibrils are little the little tiny rod-like elements made up of actin and myosin, and it's about 80% of the cell volume. And these are your striations, and they're perfectly al aligned, and you see dark bands and light bands we call I bands. So dark, light, myofibril, here each of those, and you see they're aligned with each other. So you can see the whole streak of light and a whole streak of dark. A sarcomere is the smallest functional unit of a muscle fiber. And it's the region between two Z discs. It's composed of thin and thick myofilaments made of contractile proteins called actin and myosin. So you see your thin myofilament is your actin, and it's represented by this blue here. Your thick filament your myosin, and it's represented by this red here. So you have a cross from one area here, a Z disk to Z disk, and then your M line. So here, Z disk to Z disk. So it's basically in the middle, a Z disk is in the middle of the light I band, and it's called a Z disk because it comes together like a Z, as you see here. Okay, the myosin, or the thick filaments, and it has tails, two interwoven polypeptide chains, and then heads, which are smaller, lighter polypeptide chains. And these are the cross bridges during contraction that have the binding sites for actin binding sites for ATP, and then also enzymes to break down the ATP. Actin is a little twisted strand of a fibrous F protein actin. F actin consists of a globular actin subunits, and the G or globular actin subunits bear the active sites for myosin attachment during contraction. Troponin and tropomycin are actually regulatory proteins that block the binding, that block the cross bridging. So if you have actin and mycin and actin and mycin, they can't contract, where when this troponin and tropomycin are gone, then you can get the cross bridging like from here over to here. So that are shorter. This is a good picture here. You can see the details. I got a little hand out here. Here's your heads, the binding site here, and this is a image of it. And then this is your actin, tropomycin, troponin, and the troponin and tropomycin uh, are blocking out the binding sites. Actin. Now, sarcoplasmic reticulum. You remember in regular cells we talked about endoplasmic reticulum. Well, sarcoplasmic reticulum, and again, sarco means flesh, meat. So your muscle is meat. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, it has its own name because it is so specialized. It's for storage of calcium. As long as calcium is within the sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, the muscle contraction is not going to happen. Now, we also have T tubules here that are attached to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
and they respond to waves of electrical force and let the calcium out. When the calcium is let out, then you can get the troponin and tropomycin blocked off and allow cross bridging. Now, contraction uh, does not necessarily cause a shortening of the fiber. You have to be able to have uh, the tension of the short, the tension of the cross bridges uh, is going to have to exceed the opposing force. And I, in class, I ask someone to knock the building down with their hand. And they declined to even try because they knew that the force they could use with their hand would be overwhelmed by the force pushed back by the actual building, thankfully. Sliding filament model of contraction in the relaxed state, thin and thin elements only overlap slightly. During contraction, due to the calcium coming in and moving the troponin and tropomycin, myosin heads bind to actin detach, bind in, so they propel towards the center, towards the M-line. H-zones shorten, sarcomeres shorten, the entire cell shortens, because as each sarcomere shortens, that causes the entire cell, the muscle to shorten. This is showing the uncontracted state here. You have the the myofilaments are not binding. Now here, you can see the muscle is much shorter and you're in a state of contraction. To get a contraction, you have to have certain things. Activation, it's a nervous stimulation from at the neuromuscular junction. And then excitation contraction coupling is gonna be the generation of an action potential uh, along the sarcolemma. Now, an action potential is uh, similar to an electrical current, and it's caused, well, we'll go into the details of what causes it, but you get the activation by the nerve, releases a neurotransmitter, which causes the action potential, and then the action potential results in intracellular calcium levels rising. Skeletal muscles are stimulated by somatic motor fibers. They travel from the skeletal nervous, from the central nervous system down to skeletal muscle. And each axon has several branches that enters the muscle. So the axon is actually the transmitting part of the nerve. So if this is a nerve cell body, the axon goes down this way and it gets, sends the message out to the muscle. Each axon ending forms a neuromuscular junction with single muscle fiber. Now it's situated, the neuromuscular junction is situated about halfway along the muscle fiber and you have a cleft, synaptic cleft, and it has gel or fluid filled uh, space and Vesicles that contain the neurotransmitter acetylcholine are released into that space. And the sarcolemma has acetylcholine receptors that then start the whole action potential process. But this we're actually starting up here at the nerve. This is the axon of the nerve. That's electricity or negativity is flowing along this direction. Now it's blown up bigger as you get to the end of your nerve. It triggers a voltage gated channel that lets calcium go into the cell. Anytime something goes, lets calcium get into the cell, things happen in that cell. And in this case, little packets of acetylcholine are going to be released at the neuromuscular junction and they're going to bind to receptors. So think of a ball being pitched across the neuromuscular junction. And when you get to the sarcolemma, it actually binds. And that opens a ligand gated channel, which ligand means chemical. So acetylcholine binds to the ligand gated ion channel. 
and it lets sodium flow inward and potassium gets outward. But we're not going to worry too much about potassium because it gets in and out, out and in, and it's continuously being moved around. But sodium diffuses into the cell, the interior of the cell becomes more positive and therefore less negative. Now, you, you get, as you get less negative, less positive on the outside, this is going to be our cell, this is the inside. As you get rid of all the positives and they go into the cell, what you're left behind with is negative. So as you get enough of this negative, you have a local depolarization. And as that happens, you start to get voltage-gated sodium channels opening. And now once you get that going, you have sodiums moving. So a sodium is door is open, it goes inside, you have a negative charge left behind, another sodium goes in, a negative charge is left behind. And this is really fast. I can't draw fast, but it's just you know it's microseconds. Negative, 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 like that. And the action potential is this stream of negativity. We call that depolarization. Now, local depolarization spreads uh, from the initial um, response, and then the voltage gated channels voltage gated channels open and cause a depolarization across the entire muscle sarcolemma. Now, Scott, once it gets depolarized, you have to have polarization take place. So repolarization takes place initially sodium channels close and potassium gated channels open and potassium will leave the cell now at that point you have positives on the outside because potassium is also positive but you can't have another uh, reaction another muscle contraction until the ionic condition is reinstated. Potassium cannot take the place of sodium. So you continuously have this sodium potassium pump in the cells. Grabs the sodium, throws it out of the cell, picks up a couple of potassiums, throws them in. This goes and takes place continuously. So to repolarize, initially you get the electricity sorted out with potassium. But just like before you can knock over dominoes again, you can't have another action potential until the sodiums are put back outside of the cell by the sodium potassium pump. Now, acetylcholine is going to be broken down rapidly at the neuromuscular junction by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. And this keeps the muscle from continuing to contract over and over again. Now, if you had, did not have this acetylcholinesterase, then you would have continuous contraction to the point of seizuring. And this is what sarin gas does. It blocks acetylcholinesterase. So you have acetylcholine just constantly zapping that neuromuscular junction. So muscles of respiration, all the muscles in the body are starting to contract, um, eyes are constricted. Now, one thing about acetylcholine, cardiac muscle is backwards. It actually slows down when acetylcholine stimulates it. So the patients with sarin gas or a, a lot of modern insecticides are going to die because they do not have acetylcholinesterase because Pesticides, not all of them, but some pesticides destroy acetylcholinesterase. Sarin gas destroys acetylcholinesterase. Okay, now we have this, we've already gotten our action potential going down the line along our muscle, but we haven't gotten it hooked up to causing a contraction yet. So we got to have our excitation contraction coupling. The action potential is prop propagated along the sarcomere to T-tubules. And T-tubules actually 
release, here's our T-tubules. Let's see if I can see it. You have T-tubules here. They have little, they're actually tripped by the voltage and they open up doors and let calcium out. So the calcium is freed into the cell. This is a better picture. This opens up calcium as it be free in the cell. Now, once you open up the calcium, it's going to bind to this trop tropomycin blocking site. And then troponin and tropomycin are going to be moved back, and you're ready for activation. And you can get muscle contraction at this point. As you see, this is starting to cross bridge. This also takes ATP. So, low intracellular calcium, tropomycin blocks the active sites, mycin heads cannot cross bridge and the muscle fiber relaxes. At higher calcium concentration, calcium binds to troponin, troponin changes in shape, pulls tropomycin out of the way, you do get a cross bridging and then when nervous stimulation ceases, calcium is pumped back in to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, thus ending contraction. And this is just a little picture of the contraction. This bridge, it moves over and moves over, and all this uses ATP. And putting the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum also uses ATP. And when people are dead, they're not able to have any ATP made, so therefore they go into rigor mortis. Okay. Um, Disease process involving the neuromuscular junction, myasthenia gravis, actually been found to be a series of disease because it's not just one antibody that's made, but multiple. But the immune system produces antibodies that block acetylcholine receptors. Now, since this is an overzealous immune system, you give immunosuppressants. You can also give acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. They leave more acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction, and that allows the muscles to have more contractions. Principles of muscle mechanics. The same principles that apply to a single fiber apply to the whole muscle. And contraction produces tension, and then the force exerted on, is exerted on object to be moved. And this is showing one type of contraction, isotonic contraction. The force is great enough that it actually moves this muscle, this, the muscle contracts and it moves this block here. Isometric contraction, uh, that just muscle's just not strong enough to move that block. So you're attempting to get contraction, but nothing happens. You just can't do it. Now, force and duration of contraction vary in response to stimuli of different frequencies and intensities. A motor unit is a motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers to which it supplies, that it may be small or large. So this is a spinal cord cut in half here. This dorsal, this is a dorsal side. This is for nerve uh, stimulation coming in. This is the ventral aspect and it's motor signals going out. So one motor unit is going to go out and stimulate this fiber, this fiber, this fiber, and then another one will consist of this fiber and this fiber. And small motor units where you have one nerve supplying just a few little muscle fibers are going to control fine movements, things like fingers and eyes. Large motor units are for thighs and hips. You have one nerve supplies many muscle fibers because you don't have to have that fine tuning control in your thighs and hips. Okay, so muscle fibers are also spread throughout a muscle. So you get a little bit here and a little bit there, and that causes a weak contraction of the entire muscle. Now they fire asynchronously because it helps prevent fatigue. And when we talk about fatigue in muscles, we're not talking about, gee, I feel tired. We're talking about that muscle cannot move. 
muscle tone is a state of slight contraction of all the muscles. And it comes from spinal reflexes, helps keep muscles healthy, firm, and ready to respond. And the more you exercise those muscles, the better that muscle tone is. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the only source that you can use of energy for muscle contraction. Now, in exercise, ATP is depleted in six seconds. Then you can have direct phosphorylation of ADP by creatine phosphate. So you pick up a phosphate off the creatine phosphate, stick it over here on the ADP, and you get ATP. At that point, after you've used that up, you're going to have to use aerobic respiration, which is burning muscle, burning uh, fuel, uh, just combining it with oxygen, or when you run out of that, anaerobic pathway or glycolysis. Now, we start with anaerobic, even though your body starts with aerobic. The book likes to be contrary. Once you get at a very high level of contractility, 70%, the bulging muscles actually compress blood vessels, impair oxygen delivery, and so pyruvic acid in the muscle will be converted into lactic acid and energy is released. So you just break pyruvic acid down into lactic acid. Now, lactic acid will then diffuse into the bloodstream to be used as fuel later. Then it will be converted back into pyruvic acid in the liver. Now, if you overdo exercise, lactic acid buildup is a specific chemical that makes your muscles sore. So rather than sit around and complain, you need to get up and work that lactic acid out of those muscles. Aerobic respiration produces 95% of the ATP that you make during rest or light to moderate exercise. The fuels that you burn, which burning means combining with oxygen, that's what burning is. Glycogen, then glucose, pyruvic acid from glycolysis, as well as free fatty acids, can be burned for energy. And in worst case scenario, you can actually start burning your own muscles, protein. Okay, this is showing somebody who's doing some short-term exercise. First six seconds, ATP in the muscles is used up. 10 seconds ATP from creatine phosphate is used up. Then 30 to 40 seconds is a very short exercise. I like that idea. Uh, the glycogen stored in the muscles is broken down to glucose, and then it's oxidized to create ATP. In very long exercise, you're going to have to have uh, the aerobic pathway of metabolism, and you may have to always also go into anaerobic. Uh, myoglobin in the muscle stores oxygen, hemoglobin in the bloodstream uh, stores oxygen. And then you'll have to put that oxygen back when you've used it up from just breathing. Physiological muscle fatigue is inability to contract, not you're tired, you just can't do it. it can be to having ionic imbalances like the phosphorus, phosphorus, potassium, or calcium interfere with the uh, excitation, contraction, coupling. Also, if you overdo the exercise, you can actually damage your sarcoplasmic reticulum and you can't regulate the calcium release. So if you're going to really, really do hard exercise, it's best to give yourself rest in between to allow that muscle to heal. Total lack of ATP rarely occurs, well, it doesn't occur in a living organism because you're going to have uh, contraction and of one part of the muscle and then another one. Okay, oxygen deficit is the ex oxygen you're going to have to replace after exercise for oxygen reserve, to make glycogen. Put back together and you're gonna to have to convert lactic acid to pyruvic acid, 
then glucose and glycogen. Okay, heat is produced during muscle activity. 40% of the energy released in muscle activity is used for work. 60% is given off as heat. And that is why we get build up dangerous heat levels. Now, in the equine world, I don't know a lot of, as much about human athletes. I've never been that big into exercising my own body. But with equines, we don't want to work a horse if the temperature outside and the uh, in Fahrenheit and the humidity in percent is greater than 150. So if it's 100 degrees outside and it's 50% humidity, that's Fahrenheit, and 50% humidity, and you work that horse anyway, you may have a heat stroke. And I feel pretty certain that we're going to have a heat stroke before the horse does. Okay, force of contraction is affected by the number of muscle fibers that are stimulated. We call this recruitment. Also, the size of the muscle fibers. Now, as you exercise, resistance training is going to cause hypertrophy of the muscles. You don't build new skeletal muscles, but you do build up um, you do build up each muscle fiber, so you don't get new ones, but bigger ones. Okay, next slide. Okay, force of contractions is affected by several things. Frequency of stimulation. The more frequency of stimulation, the more uh, effective transfer of tension to non-contractile components. And then also length tension relationships. Muscles contract most strongly when the muscle fibers are at 80 to 100%, 120% of their normal resting length. Now, velocity and duration of contraction is influenced by fiber type, load, and recruitment. Now, fiber types, now these, all of these are increasing force, a contractile force. Large number of muscle fibers activated. Large muscle fibers, these are ones you've exercised a lot. High frequency of stimulation, just a whole lot of effort being put into it by the nervous system. And then the muscle and sarcomere, if it's slightly stretched, it's going to contract harder than it would have otherwise. So you're increasing the contractile force. Now, fine movement, these were, by the way, and they're having a tug of war here with an object. Fine movement, you just need a few fibers to be stimulated. Bigger muscle contraction, you just need to recruit more muscle fiber. So you can be pretty sure that this gang is going to beat this gang at the tug of war. So you recruit more and more muscle fibers, you get better contraction. Okay, effects of exercise. Aerobic or endurance exercise, such as running, leads to muscle capillaries, increased number of mitochondria, increased myoglobin for oxygen storage. It results in greater endurance, strength, resistance to fatigue. You may change your fiber type into where you have faster oxidative fibers. Now, if I pick up a five pound weight as fast as I can 500 times a day, it still doesn't mean I can pick up a 50 pound weight. It means I'm really good and fast at picking up a five pound weight. To get greater strength, you're gonna to have to do resistance training, pick up weights. And this typically pushes you into anaerobic metabolism. The muscles will hypertrophy fiber will get bigger. You get more mitochondria, more myofilaments, more actin and myosin, more glycogen stores, and very importantly, more connective tissue because the connective tissue gives that muscle strength. Try to pull on muscles very, very hard without that strength, they're going to just be torn to pieces. Now, the overload principle, forcing a muscle to work hard promotes increased muscle strength and endurance because the muscles are going to adapt to increased demands. Uh, to put this simply, no pain, no gain. If you don't try, you're not going to push those muscles to get to where they can work harder. 
Okay, that's it on skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle will not be discussed today. Smooth muscle is in the hollow organs, except the heart, and it's things like guts and uh, in, your insides. It's usually in two layers, longitudinal and circular layers. And we see here a piece of small intestine. You have an outer longitudinal layer and an inner circular layer. This is the mucosa of the small intestine. And it, they contract back and forth. You get peristalsis, which is movement, contractions and relaxations of the smooth muscle that mix the substances throughout the lumen of hollow organs. When the longitudinal layer contracts, the organ dilates and shortens. When the circular layer contracts, the organ constricts and elongates. Innervation of smooth muscle, instead of the somatic nervous system like we had in the uh, skeletal muscle system, we have the autonomic nervous system. You don't get to decide how fast your guts contract. Um, they're innervated by the autonomic uh, nervous system. And rather than having the same type of neuromuscular function, you have actual varicosities, little bulbous swellings that release your neurotransmitter, which will still be acetylcholine. So here's your autonomic nervous fiber, and you see it branches out, and you get these little balls. Mm -hmm. And they all release acetylcholine, and you still get your sliding filament model going. And, uh, but it's not fine-tuned controlled. Slow synchronous contractions. And the cells are electrically coupled by gap junctions. So if I if I stimulate over here, over here, my some are self-excitatory. They just depolarize and act as a pacemaker for muscle. And the rate of intensity of contraction may be modified by nervous stimulation or chemical stimuli. Same old sliding filament, final trigger, acetylcholine is released. You have T-tubules, the final trigger is intracellular calcium increase, released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, as well as the extracellular space. Okay, special features of smooth muscle contraction. Stress relaxation response. When you feel your stomach too big or your bladder too big, but let's just use the stomach. That's more fun to think about. You eat too many, too much food, the stomach stretches, you feel full. Oh, I can't eat another bite. Oh, I'm so full. And then in just a little while, muscle well, just relax and stretch. And then you can eat more food because the stomach is so much bigger. And that's a lot of our problems. Okay, now the length and tension changes can contract between half and twice its resting length. Special features of muscle, smooth muscle, hyperplasia. Smooth muscle cells can divide and increase their number skeletal muscle when it's destroyed is destroyed cardiac muscle when it's destroyed is destroyed probably some research disagrees with that if you re if you uh, revascularize muscle after a heart attack it may regain functionality but but anyway that's debatable but we'll just go for now with a book only smooth muscle can reproduce in numbers if you get bigger muscle in skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle, it's only getting bigger. Each muscle is getting bigger. These are actually dividing. A good example, the uterus during pregnancy, obviously, it's much bigger. So this is your skeletal muscle, your cardiac muscle with your intercalated discs, and your smooth muscle. Specific uh, developmental aspects, cardiac and skeletal muscle become mitotic. They cannot re reproduce, but they can lengthen and thicken. Um, maybe some regenerative ability, so they're taking back what they said. Injured heart muscle is generally replaced by skeletal, by connective tissue. Smooth muscle 
continues to regenerate through life. Now, female muscle mass makes up about 30%, 6% of body mass, male 42% because of testosterone. But the strength per unit muscle mass is the same in both sexes. So uh, to the gentleman listening to this, if you know the female rangers that graduated from ranger school at Fort Benning, and you're the same size they are, I would not pick a fight with them because those ladies are tough. They've got tremendous muscle mass compared to the average female their size. Okay, developmental aspects. With age, connective tissue increases and muscle fibers decrease. By age 30, you start to lose muscle mass. That's called sarcopenia, unless you exercise, which reverses sarcopenia. So you've got your beautiful young figure by the time you hit 30, it's no longer free. By the time you hit 40, it goes down. And like, say 30 is the top of the hill. It continues to go down after that without exercise. Muscles will decrease. Also, atherosclerosis can block distal arteries, intermittent claudation and severe pain. That means constricting of arteries where you don't get any uh, circulation to those muscles is what they're talking about here. Now, you could, this can happen in legs, in arms. You may have heard peripheral arterial disease. Do you have PAD? Well, that's what they're talking about on those commercials. And this is our last slide, and I know you've just had such a great time listening to it, but I'm out of slides. Thank you.